All right, good morning, everyone. If you guys open your Bibles with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to continue our study here. And uh, the goal this morning is go ahead and finish verse 8 and 9. We quite, didn't quite get through them last week. And so this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about the issue of hell and the result of not trusting the gospel. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and um, look at verse 3 with me. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that he may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's talking about, you know, what's wonderful about that passage is it's talking about the righteous judgment of God, but then on the other hand, it's talking about the ultimate goal of God is to be glorified in us and us to be glorified in him. And what a wonderful thing that if we've trusted the gospel that we get to participate in, that God is going to glorify himself in us and we're going to be glorified in him. Isn't that wonderful? And so this morning we're going to talk about the issue of hell. Now we mentioned last time over the issue, we brought it up briefly of the issue of hell that Paul doesn't use that term in his epistles, does he? Now does Paul mention the issue of wrath? Sure he does. Does he issue, we're going to see this morning, he also mentions the issue of everlasting destruction. And so the issue of hell, Paul might not mention exactly by name, but the issue is still there. And so if you look at verse 7 of chapter 1, it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And we said last time, what's the number of the angels that he's going to be revealed with? All of them. We don't know the number, but he's going to be revealed with all of them. And then verse 8, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we went through some verses of looking at, you know, the issue of the fire and that the, the words that comes out of his mouth and that proceeds out of his mouth, that the word of God is like a, a fire. And, and it's not going to be a physical fire that's coming out of his mouth, but rather it's going to be what? the words of God. You know, and the same thing, when Satan came and tempted the Lord Jesus Christ while he was on earth, how did he answer him? With fire out of his mouth or with what? With the word of God. Now, could he have answered him with physical fire in that point? Sure, he's God. But what did he choose to answer him with? The word of God. How do we defend ourselves, by the way, today? How should we answer? By the word of God. And so he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them, that know not God. What's a wonderful thing that God has done is, is that men will not be able to say God did not warn them. You know, you go to Romans chapter 1. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And you look at verse 18, and it says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Who's without excuse? 
Some of mankind or all of mankind? All. And he says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up. But by the way, who gave up first? Man gave up on who first? They gave up on God first. And it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies. Where? Between themselves. Look at verse 28. It says, And even they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are what? Not convenient. And then what does he spend the rest of the chapter on? Talking about the things that are what? Not convenient. You see that? Man has been exposed for who they are. Without hope, without Christ, dead in sin. Man is without excuse. Why? Because even in our own selves, mankind knows when they do something that is wrong and contrary. Why? Because God put a consciousness into man. And so man will be without excuse. And the judgment that God gives, we talked about last time, the judgment that God is going to give, is it going to be a righteous judgment? Does he have to judge? He does. Why? Because he's righteous. But God's message to mankind today, you know, when we started off 2 Thessalonians is what? Just like in all of his epistles, grace and peace. That's the message towards man today. Grace and peace. But there is going to be one day judgment. But God's offer of salvation is freely available to all of mankind today and now through his grace and peace. Go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says in verse 8, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. But it doesn't stop there that they don't just not know God. But what is the issue? It says, In that obey not the what? The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's important to think about just because someone is near to God or has some understanding of God does not mean that they have truly known him and trusted him. Because why? It talks about even the devils believe and what? Tremble. Do they trust in him? No, but they know who he is. They've heard about him. They know and they understand who he is. You go with me to a few verses. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Some interesting verses about that. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And you look at verse 11 and 12. It says... And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house. And the child did minister unto the Lord before who? Eli the priest. Right? Then verse 12. Now the sons of Eli, Eli were sons of Belial. They what? They knew not who? The Lord. Now were they exposed to who the Lord was? Did they have an understanding of who he was? But the verse says what? They knew not the Lord. So there's people that hear and can say the name of Jesus Christ. But do they truly know him? You know, it's so sad sometimes you talk with people and they talk about trusting in Jesus, accepting Jesus into your life, accepting Jesus into your heart, but they can't tell you, guess what? How do I get saved? How, what is the gospel for today? You know, what stood out to me, a big thing that stood out to me last year, you know, we got camp coming up. It's exciting. We have camp coming up. We've had... Sounds like we're going to have, last year we had a lot of new kids, sounds like we're going to have new kids again this year too, and it's seeming that we're going to have new kids again at camp this year. And one of the kids that came to camp for the first time last year, I was talking with him, and he said, you know, I said, what's one thing you guys have learned? I know you guys have had a lot of fun. What's one thing you guys have learned this week? And he said, one thing I've learned this week, 14 years old, that the gospel should have one answer. He said, because when I ask my pastors at my church, I get a different answer every time. This week, I've gotten the same answer from every single person here. 
And that answer is, is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And by take, see, hearing that, believing that, and trusting that, that is what saves today. Out of the mouth of a 14-year-old kid. And you have pastors that stand at a pulpit every Sunday. And that stand up there. And guess what? When it talks about the sons of Eli, they knew not the Lord. They're standing there. They don't know who he is. They're preaching the gospel, but they don't know what it is. They're not making a stand for it. They're not obeying it. You go with me to another passage here. Go with me to Psalms chapter 79. Psalm 79. You look at verse 5 and 6. It says, How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Verse 6, Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen. Why? It says, That have not, what? Known thee. And upon the kingdoms that have not called, where? Upon thy name. Ultimately, is he going to do that one day, by the way? He's going to do that. And he's going to do that when? Well, he's not going to do it today because God's message today is what? Grace and peace. But he's going to do that here in the future when the body of Christ is taken out and we're caught up to be with the Lord in the air and glorified together with him. On the earth is going to be what? It's going to be judgment and wrath. And we're saved from that. But one day he's going to do, what is he going to do? One day he is going to pour out his wrath upon the heathen that have not known him. Is there people like that today that don't know him? Yeah. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. And look at verse 4. It says, Take heed, take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Verse 5. And they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to do what? Commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit... They refuse to what? Know me, saith the Lord. So was it a choice then to live in deceit? Well, it's saying that. They says that they chose to walk with those people that walk that way. They chose to believe the way that those people believe. And then ultimately they refuse to know who he is. You ever have someone you share the gospel with and they refuse to believe it? We all have, right? And when you share the gospel with them, it's the most exciting thing you can possibly share with them because you know it's the, it's the truth and it's the truth from God and you give them the truth and what do they say? I'm not going to believe that. Why? Because they're going to choose instead to trust in deceit. That's the reality and the condition of the world, by the way. They refuse to know him. It's right there in front of them. You know, in Titus, I love the verse in Titus where it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It's there. It's accessible. It's available. It's right in front of the world. And what do they choose to do? Nope. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to choose deceit. That's the condition of mankind, by the way. You go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In the verse 19, John chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. And it's speaking specifically of who at that time, by the way. Jesus Christ who would can't come for his people. And by the way, at this point, has Jesus Christ died? No. Are they to believe that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is what's going to save them? No, because it hasn't happened. What were they to believe, though? That the light that came into the world is their Messiah. But look what it says. It says, and this is the condemnation, 
that light has come unto the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Well, why? Lest his deeds should be what? Reproved. Uh, most, in the majority of time, people, when they hear the gospel and they say, you, got, you talk to someone that says, I don't believe there's a God. Right? And that's becoming more and more common, right? By the way, they do believe there's a God. Okay? They do believe it. They just say they don't. And why, though? Because if they, have, if they believe and acknowledge the existence of a God, which the God, God does exist, then what does it say there? Lest his deeds should be what? Reproved. That means then they're going to have to be accountable for the things that they do in their life, and they don't want that. But praise God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have to be accountable. He took all the sin, all the terrible things we've done in our life, and he paid for it on the cross. He did it for us. And you know what he wants? The obedience of us to say, you know what, I'm going to trust that. I'm going to trust that he did it all. I'm going to trust that he paid for all my sin. I'm going to trust that he was buried, and I'm going to trust that he physically rose from the dead to bring me life because I couldn't do it on my own. But you know what we have to admit to do that? That we can't do it on our own. That we have sin. That we are, do need to be held accountable. That's what the world doesn't want to do. By the way, mankind hasn't changed. This was written almost 2,000 years ago. Jeremiah was written even longer ago. They choose deceit. Adam and Eve had it all in the garden, didn't they? They walked with God and they chose what? We could be as gods. You see that? Praise God. You know what a wonderful thing is, is that we have obeyed the gospel and we do know him. That's a wonderful thing. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Which is, by the way, where we're going to spend, be spending a lot of time this year at, at camp talking about the issue of our identification. Being dead to sin and alive unto God. But look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 15. It says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? What does he say? God forbid. Know we not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to what? Obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto what? Righteousness. You know what he's doing there? He's asking us a question. Would you rather... In our lives, would we rather live in a system under death that leads to death, or would you want to live under something that brings life? And he says, verse, and he moves on, and he says, verse 17, but God be thanked that he were the servants of sin. So that's who we were what? That's who we were before. But do we have to choose who we're going to obey? Is it a choice of ours? It's talking about the choices we have to make. There's a few verses on that. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And verse 24. He says, No man can serve what? Two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Mammon. We all make a choice in our lives that we're going to either yield ourselves to obey the gospel, obey what God has to say to us today, or we're going to yield ourselves and serve ourselves. And when we do that, we're serving sin. Before we're saved... We don't have a choice. We serve sin. After we're saved, though, we have a choice of where we're going to place our obedience. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 
He says in John chapter 8, look at verse 32, it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? You know, that's a universal truth, isn't it? Do we know the truth? Has it made us free? It has. And he says, They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? It's a little funny they say that because the government that's in charge of that time isn't themselves, but rather who? The Romans. Now, they had their own government that they could do the things that they wanted to do in the structure, but ultimately, who was in charge? The Romans. But then Jesus answers. He says in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is what? The servant of sin. So it's pretty simple. If we sin, then we're what? The servant of sin. If we obey the gospel, then we're the servants of what? Righteousness. And we're the servants of God. Why? Because we've chosen to obey. You see that? Go back with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And verse 16 says, Knowing not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. He's saying you have freedom. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of what? Our identity before was we were what? A servant of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was what? delivered you. To obey from the heart means we did what? We had to believe, ultimately, the gospel. By the way, when did we believe the gospel? When we were the servants of sin. The moment we believe the gospel, we're then no longer the servant of sin, but rather the servants of who? Christ. We are not, by the way, it's important to think about, it's important to think about when are we set free from sin? After we believe what? The gospel. When was our sin paid for? At the cross. When do we receive forgiveness, though? After we what? After we believe. Go with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And look at verse, start in verse 35 with me. Acts chapter 13, verse 35. He says, Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on, a sleep, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Verse 37, But he whom God raised again saw what? No corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the what? The forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of who? Moses. What does that verse tell me? That verse tells me that before I've trusted the gospel, I do not have forgiveness of sins. That's what it's telling me. After the gospel and after believing, what do we then have? Forgiveness of sins. Then the question arises, well, how many sins? Are they all my sins? Have they all been forgiven truly? What about the sins I'm going to commit in the future? If I commit a sin in the future, do I need to read then go and trust the gospel again and again and again? Well, we receive, when we believe and trust the gospel, we receive complete and total forgiveness of all our sins. That load is taken off of us. Look what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Or Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted, where? 
and the beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus Christ. And so then, we're accepted then where? In Christ. So in Christ, is there any sin? Or is he without sin? So then how does God then see us without sin? Verse 7, In whom, so in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of some of our sins. The forgiveness of what? Sins. According to the riches of what? His grace. He's telling us, yes, we're not, we weren't deserving of that, but yet God made it available. And the moment we place our faith into the faithfulness of Christ, He then forgives us of what? All our sin. He then frees us from the bondage of sin and says, guess what? You no longer have to serve that. But do you still have to obey? Well, he says we either choose to obey Christ or we choose to obey ourselves and serve sin. Now, if we choose to serve sin, which we all have, right? It says that if we sin, we're the servant of what? Sin. Do we then lose our forgiveness of our sins? No, because it says we're accepted where? In the beloved, so we're in Christ. We receive forgiveness of all our sins. So if I go out today, most likely, possibly already have, probably did, definitely did because I sped on the way here. So it's running late, guys. Okay, come on. If I get pulled over, we can answer and tell the police officer we live under grace, right? We can try, all right? Right, so we, when we sin, we've sinned in our lives. Do I then have to worry about the fact then Am I out of Christ now? Or do I get to rest in the fact and say, thank you, Lord, that I have received all forgiveness of sins? We can thank God for that. Do I have to confess my sins? I don't have to confess my sins because I already received forgiveness of what? All my sins. Think about that for a moment. People will say that that is a license to go out and sin. People say, oh, you just gave them the freedom to sin. No, God gave me the freedom, by the way, to go and make the choices that I'm going to make. But when we begin to understand who we are in Christ, are we going to want to go out and sin? When we understand that he's given us his grace, and by the way, his grace came at a great cost, didn't it? What cost did his grace come at? The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for ye are bought with a what? Price. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that bought us, that saved us, that has given us forgiveness of sins. Do we want to bring glory to that? Or do we want to bring dishonor to it? We want to bring glory to that. Now sometimes we bring dishonor, and you know what the wonderful thing is, is that God the Father looks at us and still sees us as accepted in the beloved. Because you know why? We're going to fail. We're going to misstep. We're not going to be perfect. Surprise, right? We're not going to be perfect. But we're considered perfect in the Son. And we can live and walk in that. Does that make sense? Go with me to, we're in Ephesians. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. He says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he, what? Loved us. When did he love us? You know, he loved us before the world was even created. He loved us knowing we were going to do all the things contrary to who he is. He loved us and said, I'm still going to create knowing that they're going to fail. But I'm going to give up my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the son looks at the father and says, I'm willing to be that sacrifice so that we can have a relationship with them. That's how much he loved us. If you could look into the future and see if you could create something and it would be something that is completely the opposite of who you are, would you want to do it? I could say I probably wouldn't want to do it. 
But God says, I love them so much. And I want to have a relationship with them. I'm going to do that despite that. And I'm going to give them free will, knowing that they could abuse that free will. And we do abuse it. But he says, I love them so much. I'm going to let my son be the sacrifice for them. And the son obeyed the father and the will of the father and says, I, can, I will stand up and be that sacrifice for them so that they can have a relationship with you as we have together. We're invited into that. That's why, by the way, God is righteous in his judgment. Because he's made it available in every means and every way possible. It's not fair that God's going to judge. It is fair that God's going to judge. Because he did all the work despite us rebelling against him. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in what? Sins. He what? Loved us. The world that hates him today, the people in the world walking around saying that they hate God, he says they're what? That he loves them. And he says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye what? Saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards who? Towards us. How? Through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not what? He's going to remind us there's not a thing we can do. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. Is confession of our sins, by the way, a work? So, that verse tells me that I don't have to do any works to be saved. And then what does God do? He says, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. So he takes us, he places us in Christ, he takes us away from the power of darkness, translates us into the kingdom of his dear son, and gives us the ability now, and the purpose of us being created in Christ Jesus is now to serve him in good works. You see that? And he equips us to be able to do that. How did we receive all of that? By obeying the gospel. By trusting the gospel. By believing the gospel. Where did we obey it from? He talks about we obeyed it from where? The heart. Go back with me to Romans chapter 6. Look what he says there. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And verse 17 says, But God be thanked that he were the servants of sins, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, which was what? Delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to what? Righteousness unto what? Holiness. For when ye were, you know, I love all the past tense that it's using there. He's saying, you know, look at yourself differently. We need to see ourselves differently. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from what? Righteousness. You had freedom from it. Well, that doesn't seem good. Then he says, verse 21, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now what? Ashamed. The things that you did before, you're now ashamed. Is there any fruit there? No. For the end of those things is what? Death. But now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, what does he say we have? Everlasting what? Life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? eternal life through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Now with that verse in mind, those two last two verses, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
Second Thessalonians chapter one. He says, in f verse eight, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting what? Destruction. What does it say we have though? Everlasting what? Life. It's two complete opposites, isn't it? The world that doesn't obey the gospel, the world that doesn't know who he is, they receive something. The wages of sin is what? Death. What are they going to receive? Everlasting what? Destruction. But in Christ, we receive what? Everlasting life. That's the message we have, by the way. Is there an everlasting destruction? Is there wrath to come? Is hell a real place? But does everyone have to go there? God's goal for mankind and God's will for mankind is that every single person to ever have existed and to exist believe the gospel. Because why? He made it available as a gift. Would you say that sound doctrine sets us free? Sound doctrine, does it free us from the bondage of sin? The sound doctrine, is it something that we need to protect? You know, Paul talks about so many things of protecting the doctrine, standing fast in the faith, holding fast the form of sound words. That's why we teach what we teach here. But the reality is, is that one day the everlasting destruction will come. Hell existed in time past. And there's, there's so many, my time, is, my time is basically up again. I didn't plan to spend so much time on that, but you know, that, you know, that's how it is sometimes. You start talking about something and then you get talking about it and then you talk a little more about it. But when you talk about the forgiveness of God, it, it, it just makes everything else so available to us. And it's so exciting to know that we don't have to live lives in fear and guilt. You know, Paul mentioned, doesn't mention the term hell, but he mentions the issue of wrath, destruction, flaming fire, etc. Hell definitely existed. If you look in time past, it existed. Look at a few verses with me. Go with me to Numbers chapter 16. We'll run a few verses. There's not much. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. In verse 30. It says, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into what? The pit. Then you shall understand that these men have provoked who? The Lord. So when the wicked, where did the wicked go when they died in the Old Testament? Well, they go to where? To hell. Look at Psalms chapter 16. This is an interesting verse. Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16. In verse 10, it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul where? And how? Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Go to Jonah chapter 2. We're just running a few verses. I'll bring it together. Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. In verse 1 it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried 
by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of where? Hell. Cried I, and thou heardest what? My voice. Now let me ask you a question. Was Jonah someone that was saved? He was a prophet of the Lord. Where did he say he went? Hell. David, would you say that he was saved? Where did he say his soul was? Went to hell. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, it says, For as Jonas, which is who? Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of where? The earth. And where did Jonah say he went? To hell. And where is the Son of Man, which is who, by the way? Jesus Christ. Where does it say he's going to go? To hell. Now, there's two compartments there. Right? You look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. By the way, some people will say here in Luke chapter 16 is not a physical thing that took place, but I don't think the Lord Jesus Christ is just telling a story here in Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, you look at verse 19. It says, in Luke 16 and verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine lemon, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died. It was carried by angels into Abraham's, what? Bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in, what? Hell. He lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus where? And his bosom. So there's a part, hell, where they're in torments, and then also what? A place of rest, where? In paradise, in Abraham's bosom. You see that? David wasn't in torments in hell, was he? No. He was where? Paradise. So Israel, though, today, does that make sense? There's a lot of verses you can cover with that, but that's just a general picture of it, okay? We would agree that Israel is set aside temporarily for today, right? Correct? But does that mean that there's not a consequence of sin? No. Paul spends so much time talking about the issue of obedience and trusting the gospel, believing the gospel. So the consequence of not trusting the gospel, not believing the gospel, is what? Everlasting destruction. Separation from the Lord. Specifically where? A place that's set up for it, which is what? Hell. And then ultimately one day, hell is going to be taken and placed where? Into the lake of fire. Paul mentions a couple things about in 2 Corinthians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. This is just something you guys can think about. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It says, It's not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to where? The third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into what? Paradise. So at this point, you can do it in your own studies, when was paradise taken away from hell? Some point it took place, because he's saying he was where? Caught up to where? The third heaven, and he's in where? Paradise. You guys can chew on that. I'm not going to give my opinion on that. 
But it's just interesting to see that they're the separate compartments there. And now what's happened? Well, they're separated even more. So you guys can chew on that. It's an interesting study. But at some point after Israel being rendered in unbelief, the paradise section of hell was cleared out and moved. What happens to us when we die? Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse six. It says, Therefore we are always what does he say? Confident. Knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Is that true? We're here home here now but we're absent ultimately from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with who? The Lord. So the moment we die, our spirit and our soul is where? Present with the Lord. So people that don't trust the gospel, what happens to them? They're present in torment in hell. You lay that out, it's like, oh, it's a pretty easy choice. I'm going to trust that thing that's going to get me saved and it's going to put me in the presence of the Lord. But instead they choose, read that verse, they choose deceit. In the ages to come, we understand that hell is going to be taken and placed into the lake of fire. Go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says there in verse 8, "...and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and," notice what it says, "...from the glory of what? His power." And he continues on, verse 10, "...when he shall come to be glorified..." Where? "...in his saints." So the world will be in suffering. The, or I should say the unbelievers will be in suffering. While we'll be, what? Glorified. You see that? And to be admired in all them that, what? Believe. What do we have waiting for us? A glorified body. To be in glory with the Lord. Is that a maybe or is that going to happen? It's going to happen. The physical pain, the physical suffering, the spiritual warfare is all going to be gone one day. And we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. How, does, how do we get there? By obeying the gospel. Trusting that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. You know, Romans 5 verse 8, my favorite verse, a lot of our favorite verses. You guys need to get different verses that's your favorite, but it says, But God commendeth his love toward what? Us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. By the way, it's not enough that he just died for us, but he also rose again for us so that we can have that glorified body, so that we can be saved from the wrath to come. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the life that we get to enjoy in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we will not have to face the everlasting destruction because we have trusted and obeyed the gospel. Thank you for giving us the ability to rest and knowing that we have a future with you and that we have a life with you. Thank you for making us accepted in the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for your grace and peace that's being offered today, and that we get to be a part of sharing that with others. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.